Hi everyone, this is Sarah Butler with Faith Trust Institute, and we're delighted to have you with us today for Consent Conversations, a key to healthy relationships. Um, and our presenter is Reverend Kathy Reed. Um, first of all, we want to thank In Faith Community Foundation for their generous support of this um, series. Uh, so thank you, and you can visit them on infaithfound.org. Um, so, some technical information. You should be able to hear me as well as see the technical information slide on the screen. If you're having problems with your sound, then you might check to make sure that your volume is turned up or your speakers or headset are plugged in. Um, and then if you're still having problems, I recommend that you exit the webinar and then reconnect using the link in your email because that will usually fix any problems. We do want to hear from you. We're hoping this is going to be an interactive discussion. So um, we would like to have you submit questions anytime during the presentation. And then I will share them with Kathy and um, we'll just get a conversation going. So if you don't see um, the, uh, the question box on your screen, you can click on the small orange arrow, which is over here, and that will open up uh, the access to more features. And you can uh, type your questions in here. Okay. So our presenter is Reverend Kathy Reed. She is the current executive director of the Family of Youth Center in Waco, Texas, which is a comprehensive domestic violence service provider. Um, she was the founding pastor of the Austin Mennonite Church, and she was previously the executive director of the Texas Homelessness Network. Um, so she's also written several books, many of which we are going to um, list as uh, resources for today's presentation. So we'll give you some more information about that at the end of the presentation. But here's Kathy and hi. Hello, uh, I'm thrilled to be here, excited to be here. And I do hope that we do have a conversation. So I'm hoping that you will have questions or insights that you want to pass on to us. And Sarah will be monitoring all of that and making sure that you get included or if you have anything that you want me to specifically address. Um, as Sarah told you, my experience has been working particularly with younger children uh, early in my career and then later uh, with some teens and preteens. And now most of what I do is working with adults who have been in domestic violence situations. So I live here in Waco and run a domestic violence shelter. And uh, so consent is an issue that we deal with a lot. Um, it hasn't been that long, uh, as you may know, that uh, Baylor University has been going through some real struggles around Title IX and issues around consent and issues around sexual assault and reporting all that. And uh, there may be some examples that I give you as we go from my experience working here um, and working with that community. Uh, but one thing that has been in my mind ever since Sarah and I started to talk about this whole topic was I had an interesting conversation with a generic person um, who happened to be male uh, at the, I think it was the Radio Shack store. I mean, it could be any store. It don't, doesn't have to be the Radio Shack store. But um, I was talking to him and it, we were having a conversation in which he was telling me how he was personal friends with a football player and, and he was not at all worried that the young man had been arrested for rape because he knew that this young lady had consented to sexual activity because he was actually wished with the football player when he got when the football player got this text message that said, would you like to meet me? We could have a drink. Meet me at some bar at eight o'clock. And it was clear to me in that conversation that uh, this person had absolutely not a clue about what consent is, how it's given or anything about it. Um, I don't want to let anyone off the hook uh, by saying that they didn't know what consent was and therefore uh, whatever they did somehow gets a pass. Um, this conversation is meant to be one in which we are proactive in terms of how do we teach our children, our teens, how do we talk about consent uh, with young adults, and how do we even talk about consent among ourselves as even adults. Uh, whether we're in the church, outside the church, uh, at work, wherever we are, how does that issue of consent uh, come up and what's the language that we can use to really help people understand it a little bit better. So on your screen, you'll see that uh, we have some definitions of what consent is. 
so I will read them for you, uh, even though I don't like to be read to, and I'm sure you don't either, but words or overt actions by a person who's legally or functionally competent to give informed approval, indicating a freely given agreement to have sexual intercourse or sexual contact. Um, consent means giving someone a choice about touch or actions and respecting the answers they give. You can go on the internet, you can find dozens of different um, definitions of consent, but these two pretty much kind of wrap up what you'll generally find. I want to point out right away from the beginning, uh, the consent uh, fries that you see on the side, uh, which I think is really a, a wonderful way uh, for us to talk about a little bit about consent. In preparing for this workshop, I've been doing a lot of watching videos and getting information. It's been interesting because with my door open, there are lots of staff that here are coming and going and sort of seeing what's going on and staying late and noticing what I'm working on. And um, <clears throat> several of them had never heard of fries. Um, it's such a good way to talk about consent with particularly older elementary children, free preteens, teens, um, even young adults, because uh, fries, it's a really nice little way to remember um, the different kinds of elements that come into our definition of consent. So let's just start there and talk about uh, consent in terms of fries. The F stands for freely given. Um, doing something sexual with someone is a decision that should be made without pressure or force or manipulation. Uh, while someone is drunk or high or incapacitated and certainly someone who is conscious and able to give consent. So freely given kind of reminds us that that person has to be in a state of mind and play space uh, where they can freely give consent. Uh, reversible, uh, this is a good one for us to remember that consent is something that can be uh, given, but it's also something that can be reversed. So just because you want to have sex with someone, you give consent today, doesn't mean you're giving consent tomorrow or next week. Doesn't even mean that 15 minutes from now, 10 minutes from now, even a few minutes from now, you can't, re you can reverse your decision and say no at any point. It is not um, a forever written in stone kind of agreement. Informed, it's really important that um, all consent is, in it is uh, informed that means be honest um for example if someone says they're going to use a condom then and they don't uh, then the consent is invalidated there's no consent there you have to have uh you have to have informed consent so that means you you have to have all the facts kind of out there uh enthusiastic i really like enthusiastic because i think that's one of these elements that a lot of people miss when they talk about consent is uh, it doesn't mean just sort of agreeing or maybe agreeing or thinking about it or saying, well, um, it needs to be enthusiastic. Yes, let's do that. Or no, I don't want to. But enthusiastic is kind of a key part to it. And then, of course, the last um, letter in fries is S, which is specific. So uh, specific, the example that I've always heard around specific is, is if someone is asking you to do, to participate in some kind of sexual uh, contact with them, they're specific about what they want to do and what you agree to do. And that doesn't mean you're blanket giving them permission to do anything or everything, uh, but rather consent is something that's very specific and very um, really aimed at or oriented to one specific thing. So if you haven't uh, known about fries, I hope that you um, become familiar with it because I think it's really a helpful way for us to look at uh, consent and the elements of consent. So Sarah, can we move on to the next slide? Um, there are some, we're gonna even talk about later on in this, some really good videos. There are some interesting ways to talk about consent and, and there are some things that uh, are up there that sometimes may seem simplistic or um, maybe too too uh, simplistic, too, gen too much of a generalization or stereotype, we can talk about that. But the thing I find that's really interesting uh, for us to emphasize in any conversation that we have about consent is to understand that it's an ongoing conversation in every relationship. It means on an ongoing basis, asking, 
listening and really being in tune with another person. So at the bottom of all of the consent talk, it's about having a really healthy relationship. And I think that's why consent is such a great topic for a series of presentations that are really about healthy relationships. Because um, whether you're like me and you've been married for 45 years or whether you're just in a new relationship, that ongoing conversation about what is consent is something that still comes up and should be a, a, a kind of thing that you're concerned about and you know about and you're in tune with each other about um, in terms of going forward with your relationship. So consent is something that just doesn't happen once and then from there on it goes anyway, it can. It's uh, very um, ongoing in that conversation between two people. So Sarah, let's look at what I'd like to do um, is I'd really like to talk at this point about how we can start teaching our children um, about consent, even at a very early age, even talking about kids, very young children, because uh, it's one thing here, of course, at Baylor University, I'm not employed by Baylor, by the way, um, my husband is, um, and he works over there, but teaching kids um, college age is really critical, and we'll say more about that when we get to young adults, but consent is a kind of concept that it, we need to be teaching our children much younger and at an early age. And, you know, when I first started to work on consent, I thought, Kathy, you've written curriculum for church school and for churches on preventing sexual abuse. What does that have to do with consent? Well, in reality, uh, preventing child sexual abuse uh, is has some of the same elements in it that we would talk about with consent, the same way we would talk to kids. So let's talk specifically about kids, then we'll move to preteens and teens, young adults and adults. So I think one of the most important things to teach children, even at a very young age, is that they their bodies belong to them. And that is sort of just a basic bottom line kind of concept uh, that sometimes is hard for parents to even understand. Uh, children should learn that their bodies belong to them, that they are the ones that get to make decisions about it. And nobody should be telling them what they should do. Of course, in child sexual abuse prevention curriculum, you know, we go much further into um, <clears throat> what are private parts and the parts that our bathing suits cover up and how nobody has a right to touch that and all of that. But bottom line, it's about bodily uh, autonomy. And this is sometimes really hard for parents. And it's also sometimes really hard uh, for some Christian groups because, or, or other even faith-based groups, because a lot of us want to believe or want to think that we as an adult or a parent, um, in some sense, kind of have the right to touch our children, uh, when in reality from the time they can understand that concept, their body belongs to them and they are the right, they have the right to say no to anybody who asks them to do anything. So, um, you know, it's important to teach children that no one can tell you what to do with your body, not your friends, not strangers, not even adults you know. Uh, and that creates a boundary kind of. Um, in some preschools, they talk about your personal bubble, and which is your personal space around you, and how you don't have the right to intrude upon someone else's bubble uh, because it makes people uncomfortable. And the way that we get along with each other and the way we respect each other, part of how we show that respect is to create personal space between us uh, that is uh, safe and, and helps people feel respected and cared for. Uh, the second thing that goes with this whole idea of bodily uh, autonomy is of course, teaching children to ask permission before touching or embracing someone else. Um, this is a very hard concept for those of us who have grown up in faith congregations or settings where uh, we're huggers. We just can't imagine that someone else doesn't want to hug, that they that's our way of showing affection. Uh, and yet for us to learn that asking permission to touch somebody is the very groundwork at which we're starting our conversations around consent. Um, so even in church, when the pastor says, uh, greet the people on the right to the left of you and whatnot, it's appropriate and important that children learn that before they hug somebody, they need to ask permission uh, so that they can say, um, "Let's let, is it okay if I hug you? Can I give you a hug? And that it's okay. I mean, part of it, 
it, that's really important is it's not just their right to say, is it okay if I hug you? But they have to be willing to listen when someone says, no, I really prefer rather a handshake or I'd really prefer that you don't do that. Um, those of us who work in domestic violence and sexual assault know that there are all kinds of messages that are sent to people by forcing hugs on other people that we often um, un unintentionally make people uncomfortable, uh, that we can even trigger uh, memories and um, PTSD in another individual by not giving people bodily space. So asking permission to touch somebody, to hug somebody is really important. And those are key concepts for children at a um, young age. And they need to practice being able to say, I'd rather not. So, you know, the parent who says, give Aunt Edith a hug, the child has to have a place to be able to say, I'd rather not, but I'll shake your hand, or I'd rather not, maybe another time. Uh, and though that voice of permission uh, from the child needs to be respected. Uh, it's really important for kids to understand that bribes and threats are not part of consent. So I'll give you a popsicle if you give Aunt Edith a hug, or I will give you a uh, that record you've been waiting for or that dress you really want if you will sit on someone's lap. Anytime that we put bribes or threats with, some, with a, a, a request uh, to get permission to hug somebody or to touch somebody, uh, obviously it's not consent and we need to avoid doing that as parents and we need to teach our children that anytime somebody tries to bribe or threaten them, uh, they're not, it's not true consent. So uh, it's very appropriate to, for a child to learn, no, that makes me uncomfortable. And no, that makes me uncomfortable is not an insult to the other person. It's not a judgment. It's just stating matter of factly how they feel. And that voice from that child needs to be respected. It's important for all of us to remember that kids, of course, cannot consent to lots of things. Uh, they're not legally allowed to go into a contract. Uh, they're not allowed to vote. And they certainly cannot consent to any kind of sexual activity. And so we need to make sure that our children know that those are areas in which there can't be consent. And that's what we teach when we teach uh, child abuse, sexual abuse prevention, is we teach kids that no matter what the adult did, uh, no matter how the adult framed it, as though consent were given, a child is not capable of giving consent in those situations, and it is never the child's fault. So kind of repeating ourselves, but going a little bit further, it's important never to force a child to hug, touch, or kiss anybody for any reason, and to always respect the child's way of being able to say, no, that makes me uncomfortable, or I'd rather not, or yes, I'd be glad to, uh, but really reinforce those boundaries with children, even at a very young age. Um, some other things that you might not think of as really having to do with, um, with consent are things like helping children uh, learn about empathy, uh, understand that they can have, they have the power and the ability to hurt someone else so that, um, something so that when you work with small children uh, in a classroom setting or even individually or in a family that you're able to say to uh, a young child when you hit tommy he hurt uh, did you did you see his sad face um, teaching children that uh, they can uh, empathize with other kids who have been hurt is a really important thing because what we find in adults who do not have good boundaries and don't understand consent is that they lack the ability to empathize or even understand sometimes the person um, that they're harming. And so creating empathy in children and helping them learn to be able to empathize with those people who are uh, hurt or particularly when they are the cause of the, of the, of the hurt is really an important part of their development. Uh, teaching kids to help others who are in trouble kind of goes along with that for uh, talking to kids about helping or even alerting others uh, when they see someone who needs help. Um, it's important that those are opportunities, again, to create empathy and understanding in children so that they understand uh, kind of the basics and the fundamentals that lead to, um, even in the future, being able to give consent. Um, it's important that children understand that words are important. 
that we teach them that when we say stop or no, we mean stop or no. Uh, I think all women probably know very well that um, the, the saying, the adage, the cliche that when someone says no, they really mean yes, is absolutely untrue. It's not something that, um, that any of us anymore should ever agree to or understand it that way. And to raise children to understand that no means no and stop means stop and that people are serious about it when they say that. And then you have a responsibility as a person to listen to those words when someone else tells you. I think this, one of the other subtle things about consent that's often overlooked is facial expression and tone of voice. So that uh, people start to understand that someone who says, uh, would you like, when you have a setting where someone says, give Aunt Edith a hug. And if the kid says, well, I guess. That's not consent. That's not the same as enthusiastically saying, sure, I'd be glad to, or I'd love to give Aunt Edith a hug. Um, tone of voice, facial expression, those are the subtle things that are also part of consent that can't be overlooked and children need to understand early on that, um, that they can actually themselves uh, hear hear that tone of voice and know that something's going on and trust that when they see somebody who says yes but they're kind of wishy-washy about it that maybe it isn't yes and unless it's an enthusiastic yes just like in the fries it's not a yes um some really practical tips for raising children uh, to understand consent means encouraging them to wash their own genitals during bath time it's really important to do that at a young age um, it's important to give children the opportunity to say yes or no in everyday choices uh, if you read some of the literature, you probably know already that one of the things that happens with children who are impoverished and with children who are in homes where there's a lack of control, um, often they are not given choices and they're not used to choices. And choices are a great way for them to find their voice, to be able to say yes and no to things. Uh, do you want the blue dress or the orange dress? Uh, would you like to eat? cereal in a circle or would you like to eat cereal in a square would you prefer a hot dog or would you prefer a hamburger those are all choices that children can make and it's a way for them to develop their own voice about saying yes and no and one of the things that we as adults often do is we're uncomfortable talking about people's bodies and body parts and um in the sexual abuse curriculum, we do some work with helping children find the right words for body parts. And, you know, kids like to use kind of slang terms that they hear on the playground, but particularly at home and in, in conversations with their trusted adults, it's really important that they learn the proper words for their genitals and their body parts. And the more we can feel comfortable talking about those body parts, the more comfortable they'll feel in terms of talking to us. It's also important to help children understand that all of us have gut feelings. Um, there are times when our gut tells us that something isn't right. And paying attention to that message um, has encouraged people in many, many occasions to get themselves out of a potentially dangerous situation. Or sometimes when they reflect back, they realize, I've heard people say, I should have followed my gut. He made me uncomfortable. I really didn't want to be around him. I should have followed my gut. So teaching children that when they get this sense that somebody isn't to be trusted, shouldn't be trusted, that it's really okay to voice that concern to someone and to follow through with that. And that we as adults uh, can't push them into situations where they are uncomfortable when they don't want to be there. So using your words, of course, is a big part of a child, a young child developing into an older child. And we all are used to kind of telling children, you know, don't throw that temper tantrum, use your words. But the more we as parents can have children, small children, use the words, um, the better off we are. Any kind of questions about those tips I have for working particularly with small children? Sarah, did you get anything yet that we need to talk about? Let's see here. Well, you know, um, one comment that came in was uh, the realization that talking about consent is really about learning how to set boundaries and how challenging that can be and how wonderful the world would be if we learned how to do that from a very young age. Um, so I think that, you know, we do a lot of work on boundaries in Faith Trust Institute. And so it's uh, 
this comment about the consent being part of that. And then I personally then went to think about um, the Me Too movement and, you know, mm -hmm. teaching kids about empathy and all of that, how that could impact future generations. So anyway, that's all. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I think the reason that I love working with children and um, love love teaching people about how to help kids uh, at early ages learn about things is because it's so much easier to learn this stuff from the beginning than to unlearn the bad messages that many of us got growing up. And, um, you know, I think legitimately that's what's happened with a lot of people is they really don't understand. And so, you know, unlearning is always harder than learning from the beginning. So kids always encourage me. And I think it's great if we can start teaching our children about good boundaries. And you're absolutely right, Sarah. And uh, this is all about good boundaries and teaching children about good boundaries. So let me just say a little bit more about older kids then. Um, as kids get older, as they move through elementary school, um, their bodies start changing, uh, being able to have conversations about their body changing and how, and how positive it is that things are happening to them, feelings that they're getting, what feels good, what doesn't, those are all uh, the kinds of conversations that are so difficult sometimes for caregivers and parents and grandparents, but they're important conversation um, for us to have. Um, you know, I think of a, an example of uh, something that I have done for years that now I look back at myself and say, how, how did I dare do that? And that is tickling. You know, I've all, I always tickled my kids and, you know, um, this stuff on consent and boundaries forced me to rethink that. I mean, how do you ask permission to, for somebody to be, you know, can I tickle you? And if they say yes now, do they mean tickling in the future? And can you just attack people and tickle them? Uh, not to say that there aren't situations where our grandchildren and our children love to be tickled and they're willing to give consent. But once again, it's a boundary issue. And so we need to talk to kids about that. As kids get a little older, it's also important to teach children how to use safe words during play. And um, I think all of that means uh, developing sometimes, um, uh, coming up with common language that children can use when things might get out of hand or where they're starting to feel uncomfortable in a situation. Um, sometimes it's hard to say no, but maybe it's easy for a child to say peanut butter when they're starting to feel like maybe the stranger that's sitting next to them in the couch is getting over too close, but they don't know how to be polite. And yet they want to signal to their parent or a caregiver or even a friend that they're feeling uncomfortable. Uh, so to have a conversation and be able to pick up some safe words uh, in that kind of scenario is really, really good. Um, one of the ideas I read that was new to me, but I found fascinating is giving kids a chance to take a break. Um, it's okay, and it should be encouraged uh, that children when they're playing, like if they're playing pretend or they're playing dress up or something, that every once in a while they be encouraged to take some time out. Not like time out, sit in the corner, time out, count the minutes because you did something wrong. But just kind of whether it's focused on let's have a bathroom break, let's get a drink, let's do something. But giving kids a few minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes in the middle of some kind of play to where they can relax, uh, decide whether they want to continue with the, whatever activity they're in. But once again, helping them find ways to set boundaries and natural ways to let things kind of come to an end before continuing on. That can be a really good time to teach children more about boundaries and about consent. Um, a good reminder is that as uh, children reach that point where they start to notice boys, girls, uh, people uh, holding hands, uh, attractions between two people, um, it's really important to not let children uh, make fun of other people or to tease them about their relationships, uh, that's a really good time for caregivers to step in and kind of put to a stop any kind of um, making someone feel like a friendship or a relationship is somehow uh, something that can be made fun of and should be uh, a target for other children for bullying them. 
kind of a good reminder for us that children often do at late in elementary school develop crushes on other kids and that's perfectly normal and natural and if that happens um, we need to create safe space for those uh, kinds of relationships to be mutual and grow <coughs> any other questions about that in terms of kids then let's talk a little bit about preteens. Preteens is starting to get a little more difficult because the groundwork hopefully is laid with children who um, are starting to understand some of these boundary issues. Preteens, uh, there's no question, but this is the time, if not before, that you really need to talk to kids about good touch, bad touch, what's comfortable, what's not comfortable, what they're, what they're um, comfortable with what they like and what they don't like so that they can set boundaries it's also a really critical time to be working on a teen's self-esteem because we know that uh, coercive uh, sexual behavior is rampant because many times young adults teens <coughs> excuse me don't have the self-esteem haven't been able to find that voice to say no and to tell somebody that they're uncomfortable with that relationship. Uh, one of the interesting statistics I'm looking for, but I've heard and I have no idea whether it's true or not, but um, I've seen one place that sort of indicated that, you know, we think teen pregnancy is a problem often with our teenagers and we sort of work at that as communities kind of thinking that, well, kids just have um, a unabandoned sex and uh, are not using birth control and and doing all this sort of devious stuff, when in fact the the uh, the number of teen pregnancies that involve coercive sex or even rape is extremely high, and many many times the uh, young girl is unable to tell people that she was coerced or tricked or even um, <clears throat> even uh, just flat out raped. Uh, depending particularly on cultural uh, norms within her community um, so that it's very hard sometimes for people for teens to admit that uh, they didn't just choose to have unprotected sex they were forced into it so consent plays into that and teaching people good boundaries with consent is really critical in terms of our community efforts to prevent teen pregnancy uh, because if we understood consent from the way we've been talking about it then we would have a lot less uh, coercive and co coercive sex and obviously uh, we're talking about sexual assault too um, when you talk to preteens and teens it's really important to talk about how their hormones are changing uh, i think it's a really critical time for us to mentor teenage and college age boys uh, and young men about what is masculinity uh, we need more men in the conversation so that they can talk in healthy ways to uh, young men about what is consent and what it means to be a man. Um, we need to expand our definition of what is healthy masculinity. Often that's a very narrow kind of, of uh, definition that we have for young men and really help uh, young men in particular start talking about what it means to have a healthy masculinity. Those conversations start before middle school and certainly carry through, uh, through even through college where uh, transforming masculinity is a really vital part to transforming a rape culture. Um, we have far too many young men in our culture who believe any sexual activity is wanted and do not understand consent at all, but rather work from the assumption that consent is given and that they're entitled to it. And so that's obviously a really important part for us to uh, work on as educators and community leaders. Um, I think with teenagers, when you talk about consent, it's also really, really important to talk about uh, partying, uh, drinking, uh, how do you know if, someone's been drinking what kind of drug use what happens with drinking and drugging where is um what does it mean to be impaired what does it mean when someone has drunk too much how do you know that someone has, is showing the signs of being inebriated and therefore incapable of giving consent um how do you know whether it's okay to have sexual activity with someone who you may have had a drink with um 
obviously it's important that we explain to teens and young adults that someone who is drunk, high, or otherwise impaired should not be touched, harassed, or sexually assaulted, uh, and that we actually, uh, we need bystanders to stand up and, and assist in those kinds of critical times when they see something going on. Of course, Baylor's like a lot of other uh, universities that we're doing a It's On Us campaign. And uh, it, you know, it doesn't solve all the problems of consent, but it's very helpful in teaching people that they have a responsibility for when they see something at a party going wrong, when they see somebody who um, perhaps is in danger of sexual assault because they've been drinking or they're inebriated, as their friend, it's not only um, something good to do, but it's their obligation to step up and try to uh, defuse those kinds of situations and protect uh, the vulnerable person. Uh, I think that uh, most teens are very, very ready to have these conversations and want to have the conversations. Uh, sometimes they don't know how to have these conversations with their parents. Uh, this is where trusted adults, youth group leaders, uh, teachers and other uh, coaches, other important uh, mentors in their life are so critical. Uh, I always said that one of the best things my dad did was he understood that there were things that I was never going to be able to talk to him about. And he made sure that my life was filled with other people that he thought highly of and felt like had the same value as he did. So that when I couldn't talk to him or when I couldn't talk to my mom, I had someone else to talk about. Um, for me, when I was growing up, that was often somebody at church. It was my youth group leader. It was my pastor. Um, for others, it might be a different kind of setting, but having these important conversations with people around us is really critical. And I think as an as a parent or a caregiver, it's really important to understand that you can be a perfect grandparent, you can be a perfect parent, but there's going to be a time when your kid's going to have questions and need information that they're going to be uncomfortable coming to you with. And so some of these topics are the kind of thing that if they can't talk to you, you want to make sure that the people that they are talking to are people who are informed and have the kinds of values you want your kids to have, not just somebody they meet on a street corner or somebody that they just happen to be, um, you know, on their soccer team or that they just have a chance encounter with. Because uh, teens are readily able and want to really, really get that kind of information. Now, I want to give you a couple ideas for some really what I think of are some good activities to do with teens if you're trying to work on issues around consent. Um, one is to do a simple, simple task. Uh, ask kids almost like a role play to uh, pick one person, pick two people in the group and have one person ask for a pen. Can I borrow your pen? Those are the only words you give them. You can write it on a card or something. And then ask them to ask for the pen in different tones, meaning, can I borrow your pen? Or can I borrow your pen? Or I'm going to borrow your pen and snatch it from their hand. Uh, tone of voice. Uh, facial expression, maybe even gestures, as I was doing gestures, are really important aspects of consent. And getting kids to understand with something as simple as borrowing a pen or uh, taking a book out of somebody's hand gives them a chance to try different tones and to understand that tone of voice and facial expression is really important. Uh, another great activity is to have a kid uh, stand up there and take their cell phone away from them and just grab it out of their hands. And when they say, hey, why are you taking my cell phone? Uh, the answer is something like, well, you said last week when I, that I could borrow it to call home. Nobody would expect to say, sure, you can borrow my cell phone to call your mother now. And a week later for somebody to come up and grab their phone out of their hands. And yet people do it, teenagers do it, young adults do it around sexual activity all the time. You know, you agreed to have sex with me last week, so surely you're gonna have sex with me this week. Or you agreed to hug me last week, so you must be in the mood for me to hug you now. Um, so it gives teens a chance to kind of practice asking for things and not making assumptions about consent that somebody's given them. Uh, finally, there's an activity that's called people to people, which I think is a real kind of interesting experiment. You can have the whole group uh, 
uh, obviously you have to get people to consent to do the activity, but the activity is to ask them to put their hands together. So hands together from two different people like this, and uh, then ask them to, uh, instead of putting their hands together, put their elbows together and see how that makes them feel. And eventually get to the point where you ask them to uh, put their stomachs together. Now, the whole point, of course, is that you're trying to see where their boundaries are and where they're ready to say no. And if not, I'm not I'm not doing that. And you could well have some kids who have good boundaries who right away pass maybe hand to hand or maybe they don't even want to do that part. Uh, but the point is for them to understand that different people have a different sense of what that boundary is. Um, and so it's important to know that when someone says no, they mean no. And when someone says I'm not comfortable with that, what that really sort of means. Um, for adults, I think uh, sort of the, the summary is, is that when we as adults talk, there are some really key points that we need to be reminded of and we need to remind others of. One is that silence is not consent. Um, so uh, it, a lot of people think that unless there's yelling, screaming, somebody yelling, no, 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 and putting up a fight. Uh, we hear this all the time when you go to court on sexual assault cases, uh, you will often have a perpetrator say, uh, well, she didn't say no, she didn't yell, she didn't scream, she didn't push me off, she didn't take that kind of action. Well, you know, as, as most of us know, we know that uh, particularly in rape and sexual assault, is the victim is always trying to calculate what's my best chance of getting out of this situation even alive. And when am I going to enrage and inflame the perpetrator? Uh, so how can I manage this so that I can leave and be a living human being? And so their response is not always a, a physical response that someone, if you believe if the perpetrator uh, is thinking while well, it's yelling and screaming, okay, she's not yelling and screaming, so she's giving consent. Uh, it's really important for us to understand that silence and or the lack of yelling and screaming is obviously not giving consent. I think it's really important in this day and age, we um, are all aware of so much of the stuff that we see on TV with the Me Too movement <coughs> and to sexual assault. Um, there are far too many adult people who are not in tune with bodily expressions, facial expressions, uh, someone pulling away from them, or just plain somebody showing them signs of being uncomfortable. Um, whether it's ego, whether it's male masculinity, whether it's whatever the excuse from the perpetrator's side is involved in that, uh, all too often the perpetrators are far too overlooking of all the signs around them that show that the person was not giving consent and was not a willing partner in it. Um, in whatever uh, the activity was. And so, uh, teaching people to be more cognizant of facial expressions and bodily language is a really important thing for all of us to be reminded of. Uh, obviously, in terms of sexual activity, no one should ever be pushed or controlled. Um, if they're drunk, passed out, asleep, wasted, unconscious, whatever, uh, they can't give consent even as an adult, uh, and we need to respect that. We need to be honest. Uh, being honest means maybe sharing uh, any kind of disease a person might have, an STD, uh, whether they're willing to use a condom or not using a condom. Those kinds of uh, frank conversations are really critical um, in adult relationships. Um, sex is really about connection and respect and healthy relationships and mutuality. And so we need to have all those different aspects in order to really um, be in a relationship that's healthy and where sexual activity is actually fun, interesting, enjoyable, and the E in fries, enthusiastic. Uh, all of us want that scenario. We don't want the opposite. And so to be reminded about those things is really important. Um, there are some really helpful things out there for you if you are working on consent with kids, teens, um, adults. Uh, do we have the next slide, Sarah? 
oh, before I even get to that, I love this slide, um, this paradigm shift. Uh, last night I was watching Sleeping Beauty with my eight-year-old boy. Oh my God, he just kissed her. Yeah, to wake her up. You can't just kiss people. You have to ask first. What great example of an eight-year-old that's been taught good boundaries, understands you have to ask for permission. Um, there's a lot of lack of consent in so many things. Uh, and I always think of my mother's favorite movie, which was Gone with the Wind, which I couldn't stand to watch because I knew rape when I saw it. Uh, and my mother thought that that had consent to it. Um, she lived in a different time and had a different definition. Um, but that, you know, is not true now. And I think all of us have probably watched movies or seen something where we thought, whoa, that is really dated and it does not meet our standards of today in terms of boundaries and consent. Um, I want, if you have a chance, I would highly recommend you look at the consent. It's simple as T. Um, some people don't like it. The criticism is generally that it's too simplistic and it does not take in uh, any of the conversations that uh, we've been having about facial expressions and tone of voice and all of that is really kind of absent um, from the consent is simple as tea. But I think it's a great way to start a conversation about what is consent. And there is a kid's version of consent um, by the same people as the adult consent is like tea. It's wonderful because if you are in a situation with either elementary school kids, middle school kids, high school kids, and you have trouble or you're not sure how you're gonna talk about sex, uh, this is a great thing because it's about tea. And so uh, the script is pretty straightforward. Uh, it's all about serving tea. And before you serve tea, you say, would you like a cup of tea? And uh, you go make the tea and it's wonderful and you give the person a tea, but if they've changed their mind that they don't want the tea, you don't force them to drink the tea. And uh, the, the script goes on to say, you know, if a person's unconscious and laying on the ground, you don't, you don't pour the tea down their throat. Um, if they uh, decide that they want tea today, but they don't want tea next week, uh, then it's okay not to, to force them to drink tea. Uh, it puts all of those nuances about consent into a simple format that just says we would be a lot better off if we could talk about consent in the same way that we talk about serving tea to other adults, asking them, listening, um, letting them change their mind, uh, not forcing them to drink tea, uh, not uh, making, get, forcing them, to, you know, if they wanted tea last Sunday, not making them drink tea this Sunday, uh, all of those kinds of concepts that we've talked about in the context of, um, in the context of uh, asking somebody if they want tea. It's really a cute, fairly short, I think it's less than three minutes video readily available on YouTube. And so it's something pretty simple that you can share with people and it gives, it's a good, um, good conversation starter. Um, I'd highly recommend that if you're using it, that you move into what I think of as more of the complexity of tone of voice, facial expression, how people say no, what it means to really fully give consent, uh, some of the kind of important nuances to it uh, so that you go beyond just sort of the simple as T concept. But it's a great beginning point because um, I've been playing it here um, as I was preparing, and it's just funny to have staff stop by and be talking about tea and how they saw, heard my video, and they went back and they watched it, and it's interesting to see their reactions and, and their comments, and, you know, then I hear people saying, yeah, don't give an unconscious person tea. Um, don't force tea down somebody's throat, and they can change their mind whether they want tea. So those are some of the key concepts. Sarah, do we have any more questions? Uh, yeah. So one of the uh, uh, comments is that uh, what this person likes about the consent um, concept for raising issues of sexuality is that you don't necessarily just talk about sexuality. Consent is about everything in a relationship. It's about deciding how you're going to make decisions together and so that it's a much broader um, conversation than just are we going to do X, Y, and Z, um, you know. 
And, and I think, you know, particularly when you're doing what we're trying to do today, where we're talking about kids at maybe a very young age, I mean, it becomes intimidating when we start to think, oh, we have to talk about co consent in terms of sex with young children. Well, you don't have to do that. What you have to do is start teaching good boundaries and giving permission to people and asking people if you can touch them, uh, meaning hugs and kisses and um <clears throat> those kinds of things. So it gives us a framework to begin those conversations with very young children before we're ready to talk about sex. And um, then it carries through as we grow mature and, and start having relationships. Um, and it's absolutely a key part to having a healthy relationship. Um, as the executive director of a domestic violence shelter, you know, that's what I see every day is people who have lived their lives without any control and any ability to make any kind of decision where someone else uh, is calling all the shots all the time. And for many of the women who live in the shelter, they've never been empowered to uh, choose clothing they want to wear, pick out purchases they want to have, decide on a menu, figure out where they're going to a restaurant. Uh, if you have a healthy relationship, you take for granted probably the mutual decisions that you make, uh, whether you always agree or not, or whether you say it's your turn to pick and my turn to pick and tomorrow will be your turn, whatever our, um, however our relationships are mutual and, su and supporting between us, uh, those are key concepts that are rooted in consent that go so far beyond just sex. Right. Yeah, so I just want to let everyone know that um, there are some handouts here that people can download. One of them is a resource list which contains all of these resources that are listed here. And the videos that are here are um, videos that you can use with teens, young adults, um, even middle middle school kids. And the, the one that you were just talking about, consent at simple, like, like T, is great for middle school to high school. And then video consent for kids is the one you were talking about, which is the, yeah, for, the little for kids. Much younger kids. Yeah. Um, and then there's a couple of other videos down here, um, Ask, Listen, Respect, which is showing young people kind of um, negotiating their relationship and what they're going to do and who wants to do what, and but in a, you know, not in a uh, lurid way. Um, so uh, these are really great resources for starting conversations. Um, and then we have some books here, including um, including Kathy's books on preventing child sexual abuse, which was curriculum for faith communities and, and schools. Um, so uh, if anyone has any last questions, you can go ahead and send it in. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about, Kathy, was you mentioned the, the bystander training program that is kind of taking off everywhere in, in colleges, and now I think it's moving into high schools. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea that that is um, the basis for that, you know, being responsible for other people is recognizing when people can and can't give consent. So how effective do you think that that those programs are? Uh, well, I think it'll be interesting for us to see. It's probably too early, although my guess is somebody's already researching it and probably knows. Um, I, I hate to I don't want to I don't want to throw cold water on a good idea because I think it's really good to do bystander training. I think it's an excellent kind of thing. It does not take the place though of teaching people really about sexual assault and, and, and boundaries. Um, and, you know, I would say, you know, it was an easy step early in the process here at Baylor with the issues that we had at that, at the university, it, that's a really easy step to do the it's on us training. Uh, people aren't defensive about it, um, which is a good thing. Um, and uh, bystander training is probably more effective than put, make, putting people on the defensive and making them think they're evil or awful or that we're accusing them of that. But on the other hand, uh, it doesn't necessarily fix the situation. I think it's a good step in the right direction, uh, but it's maybe not uh, going to be, uh, you know, the solution to everything uh, that we would like for it to be. Uh, and, you know, it's it's pretty easy to do it. And um to do the bystander training. And I think it's good that we are. I think we need all of these little steps because without these little steps, we'll never get to the bigger, harder 
discussions that we need to have. And I look forward to um, Baylor University having some of those more difficult conversations in the future and hope that they're willing to do that, that bystander training isn't the only thing. Well, that actually ties in really well with the next question, which is, um, uh, she says, I love that you discuss transforming a culture with discussions of healthy masculinity. Can you say more about that? Well, I think, I mean, I think, I think, I think, you know, it's funny because I work in Central Texas and so I can't, there, there are some things that when I fundraise in, sex, in Central Texas, I don't have as many opportunities to talk about because, um, you know, I'm trying to help people understand domestic violence in ways that they can understand. Um, but I think, you know, when it comes down to it, um, a lot of our conversations about consent are really about the way that we have raised boys to think about sexuality. And that's a really important thing. You know, it's, um, we just got done having the what she was wearing display here uh, in, in Waco, and we co-sponsored it here at Family View Center, as well as with um, the Advocacy Center, our sexual assault uh, center, and Baylor University to start talking about um, how, uh, you know, shaming people about what they were wearing and, and just breaking open those myths about what people were actually wearing, you know, their work uniform when they were sexually assaulted. It's really important that we start working on those issues. But I really think the hard work that is ahead of us is to really start to talk about uh, male masculinity and sexuality in a way uh, that is helpful uh, for men to really understand ways in which they use uh, sometimes their power, their size um, in, in negative ways that wind up being sexual assault. Um, and, you know, I think we have raised too many young men to think that any sex is good sex, and and uh, it, it it results itself in uh, uh, sexual uh, child abuse, uh, sexual child abuse of uh, young men being underreported, because young men have a very hard time ever admitting that they were sexually assaulted. Or I think any male has trouble admitting they were sexually assaulted because we raise men to think that any sex is good sex. Uh, rather than talking about masculinity and sexuality in males in such a way that um, helps people understand that uh, consent and boundaries and mutuality, all of these things are really important to to uh, how a person sees themselves, whether they're male or female. And we have really uh, let, let a lot of men be in situations where we have let their misconceptions about what masculinity is ruin the lives of people who are around them as well as their own. So uh, I think that's a huge task that is ahead of us and we need a lot of men to be in solidarity with us women in terms of changing the conversations that um, our young men particularly have around sexuality and boundaries. Yeah, I mean, I think it's Jackson Katz who says, you know, sexual assault is not a woman's problem, it's a man's problem. Um, yeah, what, I mean, and it's not about what she was wearing. It's, right. you know, it's not about reducing, I mean, the number of people who are drinking. It's not about reducing sexual activity among young adults. It's about teaching young men and men in general that rape is not, is, is not allowed and not good, uh, rather than couching it in other terms that make it seem acceptable somehow. Yeah, and again, we go back to the, the idea of consent being, um, based in respect. And if you don't exactly. have basic respect for another person, you know, yep. you so it's ask, listen, respect. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it looks like that's the, uh, the end of our questions. Um, is there anything you'd like to say just to kind of close us out here, Kathy, or? I just appreciate you taking on the topic. I hope that some of this information has been helpful to you and uh, that we can start having more conversations in our faith communities and in uh, our broader communities about consent so that we start really being able to raise children to understand those boundaries and those bubbles and, and the ways in which we, uh, are setting them up for uh, healthy, healthy relationships as they grow into adulthood and uh, throughout their lives. So thank you for paying attention to consent. <laughs> thank you so much, Kathy. It was great to see you. And thank you everybody for joining us. Um, 
and we'll you'll be asked to fill out a short survey when you when you leave if you could just take a moment and fill that out let us know if there are any other topics that you'd like us to have uh, webinars or conversations about that'd be wonderful i think that we need to uh, consider doing a webinar about the Me Too movement and toxic masculinity and consent and like, you know, the big, there's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of stuff out there. So that will be somewhere in the future. Okay. Thanks everybody for joining us and uh, have a good evening. Bye, Kathy. Bye.